The Peter Schiff Show. All of the major U.S. stock market indexes finished the second to last trading day of this year in the red. Although it's not just the second to last trading day of the year, it is the second to last trading day of the decade. Although technically speaking, I know the next decade doesn't really start until January 1st, 2021, but practically speaking, it's going to be the 20s. So to me, that's a new decade. So let's just say tomorrow is the last trading day of the decade. And even if we get another decline tomorrow, I don't know what's going to happen. Maybe we'll get a bounce, but I doubt it will be significant enough uh, to turn the tide on this uh, bull market run or this bubble bear market rally, whatever you want to call it. But it looks like we're going to finish the year uh, with a gain of close to 30% in the S&P 500. That's going to put uh, the market... Uh, with its best annual increase since 2013, which, of course, is not that long ago. So we did have a rise in 2013 when Obama was president, uh, where the S&P had a year that was as good as this year when Donald Trump is president. So clearly, it's not simply a case that we have Trump as president, and that's why we have such a strong market. We've had plenty of years where the market was this strong, and Trump wasn't president. In fact, Barack Obama was president. And one of the reasons that the market was so strong this year is because it finished last year uh, so weak. I think the fourth quarter of last year, I think we were down 13, 14 percent, something like that. But it was a very big decline, which would have been much, much bigger. But for that record surge the day after Christmas, remember that Boxing Day, I think the Dow was up like a thousand points or something like that. But the tide that turned the market was the capitulation by the Fed. That's when the Fed first came out and softened its stance on the rate hikes and the quantitative tightening that it had been claiming were going to happen uh, in 2019. And that is the only reason that we have these strong gains. Because we didn't have good news in the economy, really. We didn't have good news on corporate earnings. We didn't have good news on trade. We didn't really have good news on anything. Yes, the unemployment rate continued to trend down, but that's not new. Uh, That had been happening uh, for the entirety of the decade with the unemployment rate going down. The one thing that changed that really blew more air into the big, fat, ugly bubble that Donald Trump inherited from Obama was the Fed. And of course, all those Wall Street forecasters who thought the market was going to be up in 2019, who ended up being right, were right for the wrong reasons, because they also thought the Fed was going to keep hiking. They also thought the Fed was going to keep shrinking its balance sheet. They were dead wrong. Had they done that, had the Fed done what everybody on Wall Street expected, the market would have tanked, and this would have been a down year. Uh, And you know, Trump would be looking even weaker uh, than he does in the polls because he would have presided over a bear market. Instead, we have a bull market that he can claim credit for, but the credit really goes to the Fed. Although, again, it's not credit, it's blame because you don't credit somebody for something bad. When they're responsible for something that's bad, they get the blame for that. They don't get the credit. And the blame for inflating the stock market bubble goes to the Federal Reserve because they supply the air. Now, Donald Trump likes to take credit for that bubble. Of course, he wants to deny that it's a bubble. When he was a candidate, he was far more honest about calling a spade a spade when it came to the stock market bubble. But now that it's his bubble, well, of course, he has a completely different uh, perspective. But, you know, if you look around at what also happened, uh, yes, stocks were up, you know, the S&P up about 30%. Again, the year isn't over yet, but about 30%. I think it's about 29 right now. So call it 30% gain. But look at the gold stocks. Look at the GDX. Uh, Gold stocks are up 40% this year. So people that want to accuse me, oh, Peter Schiff, you missed out on this big rise in the U.S. stock market. Well, no, because I had a lot of gold stocks. I had a bigger gain in my gold stocks in 2019 than people had in the S&P. And in fact, if you look at the big drop that the S&P had in the fourth quarter of last year, 
gold stocks didn't have that big drop. They actually were up about, I don't know, 13 14% in the fourth quarter of last year instead of being down 13 14% like the S&P. So if you want to look at how much gold stocks have outperformed the S&P 500 starting with the fourth quarter of last year through the end of this year, which is five full quarters, uh, gold stocks are killing uh, the return on the S&P. So I'm not missing out on any gains by not being in the S&P to the extent that I'm in gold stocks. People are missing out on gains who are in the S&P and not in gold stocks. Now, of course, the U.S. stock market still managed to outperform a lot of other emerging markets and a lot of foreign markets that I have been investing in over the year. But I believe that you're going to see a big increase in the relative returns internationally than you're going to see um, domestically because the dollar is going to turn. In fact, the dollar index is still holding on to a 50 basis points approximate gain for the year. It has been weakening towards the end of the year, just as gold has been strengthening. Gold now is back above 1500 I think it's around $1,515 $1, approximately. But the dollar index closed today at 96 spot 77. It closed last year, I think, at 96 spot maybe 17. So, again, only about a 50 basis point move up in the U.S. dollar. Now, the dollar should have moved down. It really should have, given the about face that we had at the Fed, but it didn't happen. But again, that doesn't mean the the dollar's execution has been called off, right? It's just been stayed for a while. Uh, The dollar's still going to get killed. It's just that it's going to get killed not in 2019. We'll see what happens in 2020 and uh, and later. But I think the dollar is going to begin a major, major decline. In fact, what is going to define the 2020s is going to be weakness in the U.S. dollar. It's going to be the inflation that results, at least the increases in consumer prices, in long-term interest rates. It is going to be a decade of stagflation, although that's probably a mild way to describe it. Because if you talk about stagflation, it's reminiscent of the 1970s. And yes, you know, that was a bad decade for the economy. But I think the 20s, the 2020s could end up being a lot worse than the 1970s. And so they're going to be worse, I think, than the 1920s, right, where we had a depression. I think what we're going to have in the 2020s is going to be an inflationary depression, right? We're going to get inflation and a weak economy, only much weaker than the economy was in the 70s with even more inflation. And so that's why I'm saying an inflationary depression. Now, who knows what the official CPI is going to be? I mean, clearly it's going to be much higher than the Fed's so-called 2% uh, you know, ceiling, which is now a floor, whatever you want to call it. But the real inflation rate is going to be substantially higher than what the government will admit to uh, with its with its measures. Uh, because even if you measured inflation today, if you went back and you measured it the same way we did in the 1970s, we'd have inflation that's much, much higher. In fact, if you look at the money supply growth, money supply M2 is growing at what, 7 8% a year. I mean, that is more reflective of the actual inflation rate than the consumer price index because it's the money supply that is being inflated. That's what inflate means. It means to expand. And we're expanding the money supply at 7 8% annual rate. Well, that's the inflation rate. It's the rate at which the money supply is inflating. And I think that rate is going to rise dramatically, and so too will its impact on consumer prices. In fact, not only was the U.S. dollar down today, but the U.S. bond market was also down. And that's also going to be part of the big story of the coming decade is not just going to be rising consumer prices, but rising long-term interest rates, right? That's where we had uh, the the misery index uh, that we had in the 1970s that um, Ronald Reagan used against Jimmy Carter. Well, it's coming back. Only we're going to be a lot more miserable because we have much bigger problems now than we had back then. But I tell you, you know, the the decade, the one that we just finished, the teens, did not really go the way I thought, you know, back when I was writing, you know, my book Crash Proof back in 2005, 2006. I did not think back then, knowing what I knew 
right? Believing we were headed for this financial crisis, uh, the collapse of the real estate market, all the things that I knew were going to happen that in fact did happen, I had thought that we would have had to pay the piper by now, that sometime during this decade, we would have had the real crash, the world would have waken up, uh, the bottom would have dropped out of the dollar, and the chickens would have come home to roost on all of the profligacy. But instead, we kicked the can down the road for the entire decade. And of course, even if you remember, when the last decade was coming to an end, right, um, we were about to launch the Tea Party, right? The Tea Party came in in, in in 2010, protesting the big increase in the national debt. The national debt had gotten up to almost 12 trillion, I think, or about 12 trillion uh, by the end of 2009, right? It really started to explode in the last year of Bush's presidency, but then you know took off under Obama. And Republicans, when this decade started, were really pressuring to have some type of deficit restraint. I knew at the time that it was all BS, uh, but it, people acted as if we were really making some headway. We had some rules that were put into a place by the newly elected Republican Congress to kind of force some you know, modicum of fiscal responsibility, if you want to call it that, on, on government by having some limits to the way the debt can be increased, right? There was a real pushback against the debt. Well, of course, all that's been abandoned by now as the decade comes to a close and a new decade is about to start. And the national debt, at least the official national debt, is upward of $23 trillion, right? We're now, you know, the, the national debt clock, you could just go to the website, we're at 23 spot call it, trillion dollars. I mean, we're you know barreling towards 24 trillion. We've almost doubled the national debt. If it ended the last decade at 12 trillion, and now we're you know over 23 trillion, we've almost doubled the debt uh, during this decade, and no one cares, right? As we're ending the decade, neither party. I mean, clearly the Democratic Party is not going to give a damn about the debt, but either do the Republicans, right? No one cares about the debt. Well, I do think that we're going to have the day of reckoning in this next decade because I don't see how we can go another decade doubling the debt, which would mean what? We go from $24 trillion to $48 trillion? <laughs> There's no way that's going to happen. We cannot stay on this trajectory without a collapse. And to me, you can already see a lot of warning signs, and we've been talking about them. I've been talking about them, rather, on this podcast. A lot of people in the media have been ignoring them because they're focusing on, you know, the new highs in the Dow and the Nasdaq's above 9,000 for the first time ever. And so everybody just wants to focus on those so-called positive, uh, you know, benchmarks that we're seeing and ignore a lot of stuff that's going on in the markets, you know. I read an article today that this was the fifth year in a row that more hedge funds closed down than started up. And I look at this and have been looking at this as kind of a, a bearish uh, sign of the market mania, right? Because what's happening is the reason hedge funds are closing down is because they can't beat the market. And why can't they beat the market? Because it's a bubble. Right. If you use your brain, which supposedly the guys that run the hedge funds are being paid the big bucks for using their brain. Right. And trying to outsmart the market and trying you know, not to buy stuff that's overpriced and, and look for real investment value. Right. So they can deliver the alpha right uh, to uh, to their clients. Well, that's been harder and harder to do in the short run. Because the people who don't use their head, who just buy whatever crap is going up, right? If you just buy the stuff that's going up, well, you make more money than the people who are trying to find value. And so uh, the hedge funds community has been having a hard time retaining their customers because people are just saying, well, I'm just going to buy the indexes. Why should I pay somebody to use their brain when I can make more money not using my brain at all? But that is what happens in a, a mania. Right. I mean, that's that old expression. Don't confuse brains for a bull market. 
right? People are making money despite making bad decisions because everybody else is making the same bad decisions they are. And so the fact that all these value investors are having to throw in the towel because they're losing their clients to the indexes because the fees are lower and the returns are higher, that's, again, more of a sign uh, of a mania. Now, they've been doing it for five years in a row, so I don't know if there's anything special about uh, 2019, but I just think in general, the fact that so many people you know, are throwing in the towel on using their brain and are just chasing the momentum just shows you that, you know, we're getting near the end of, of this cycle. And of course, some of the, you know, the mania, right? Some of that uh, bloom has come off the rose. The froth has come out of the market this year. I've talked a lot this year on the podcast about the blow up of the IPO market, right? A lot of these new IPOs, uh, the ride shares, you know, the Ubers and the Lyfts, uh, a lot of these companies are way down this year from their IPO price. A lot of companies like WeWork never even got to go public. They had to call it off and headed for bankruptcy and other high profile deals that never actually saw the light of day, right? This is an indication that we're running out of uh, room for this bubble to grow. And look at what happened to the pot stocks this year. You know, the cannabis companies, they got smoked. I mean, literally uh, had one of the worst years. You have a lot of these stocks that are down. Aurora Cannabis, right? Symbol is ACB. That stock didn't make, didn't close at a new low. It closed unchanged at $1.91, but it hit a 52-week low of $1.88. And Canopy Growth, which is weed, that finished down $2.39, $2.39, not a new low uh, for the year, but the high was over $70 a share. Stock is now at twenty four fifty one. dollars Of course, the biggest decliner is this company, Tilray. Although on the year, I think it's only down about 70%, which is still a lot. Closed at a 52-week low today. It was down 3.69%. $15.72 was the last price. But remember, it traded at $300 a share in the, the third quarter. In September of last year, 2018, so five quarters ago, the stock printed 300, now down 95%. So a lot of people were very excited about these pot stocks and money piled into them. And so that bubble blew up in, uh, in, in 2019. So there are these signs this where the speculative froth is coming off, yet you know the averages are still moving up. And they're still floating on a sea of liquidity that's being provided by the Fed. And everybody is trying to pretend that there's something fundamental to this market, that there's some reason for the market to go up other than the Fed, when there is no reason for the market to go up. You know, even the the Federal Reserve, they came out with a study and a lot of people, of course, want to uh, dismiss it. Uh, People say, hey, I'm a hypocrite because why am I pointing to a study that the Fed did? Look, not everything the Fed does is going to be wrong, but they put out a study in which they showed that the tariffs backfired. That Donald Trump said, hey, we're going to have these tariffs and it's going to help on manufacturing. It's going to help on trade. And in fact, the opposite has occurred, which makes sense because that's exactly what I said was going to happen as soon as Trump launched the trade war. I said the tariffs were going to backfire. And now you have the Federal Reserve confirming exactly what I said. So we haven't had good news on trade. The only good news is that we may be surrendering. We may be calling off the war with a BS uh, phase one deal that basically doesn't accomplish anything. We don't even have that yet. We don't even have phase one yet. So nothing really happened other than the Fed uh, going back to QE, even though they want to deny that it's QE. The balance sheet continues to grow at a faster pace now uh, than it did um, when they were doing QE, we're now up to about $4.2 trillion almost in the Fed's balance sheet. Maybe even by the end of January of next year, we could be at $4.5 trillion. We'll see. We'll be at an all-time high for the balance sheet, and then we'll just you know keep on going after that. But that's the only reason that the markets have gone up. And of course, that has enabled all sorts of credit, all sorts of borrowing, not just in corporations, but the government has been able to borrow without a bigger increase in long-term interest rates. You know, I read an article today about the refi markets, cash out refinances, which have really been uh, picking up recently. But in the last year, according to this uh, study, 60% of the cash out refinances, the people who did this ended up with a higher interest rate on their new loan 
then on the loan they refinanced. Now, you know, when interest rates were falling and people were taking, hey, I have a 5% mortgage and I'm going to refinance and now I'm going to have a 4% mortgage, right? That made sense because they were actually refinancing into a lower cost loan, right? Their monthly payments were going down. So they saved money by refinancing. In fact, people were doing a cash out sometimes. You could get such a big savings in your interest rate that even if you took cash out, and ended up with a bigger mortgage, you ended up with lower payments on that mortgage because that bigger mortgage was financed at a lower rate. So for a lot of consumers, it was a slam dunk. I get cash, and at the same time, I end up paying a lower mortgage payment than before the refi. Well, that's not what was happening in 2019. People were taking, let's say, a 4% mortgage that they had, and they refinanced it into a 4.5% mortgage. So they have a higher rate, and their payments are going up, yet they're taking cash out anyway, which means their payments are really going up because now they're financing a larger balance with a higher rate. So why would people do that? Why would they cash in a really good loan to get a new loan that's not quite as good as the loan they had? And the reason is because they need the money. Now, some people say, well, I guess it's a smart move because maybe they're taking the money and they're paying off their credit card debt, which might have been 18% interest. And so they, you know, they're, they're, this is cheaper, which is true. But that means that there's actually a lot more credit card debt out there than the record amount of credit card debt that we know about if people are basically using their houses instead of a credit card. But of course, there is another big downside to uh, using your house. And that is when you refinance your house, that mortgage is, is a recourse loan, right? So the bank can come after your house if you don't pay. If you don't pay your credit card bill, the bank can't come after anything. You know, it's just, you know, that's all they get is the credit card. It's an unsecured loan. And in fact, you could go bankrupt and you wipe out all that credit card debt if you want. Uh, but mortgage debt, you have pledged an actual asset. And a lot of times when you refinance your mortgage, you go from a, uh, a non-recourse loan which a lot of mortgages are non-recourse if it's purchase money. If you borrow money to buy the house, in many cases, the house, the loan is non-recourse, meaning the, the bank can take your house, but they can't take anything else. But when you refinance, you lose that. And so after the bank takes your house, if there's not enough money there, they can come after your other assets. So consumers are putting themselves at greater risk to save some money when they take all their credit card unsecured debt and they move it into their mortgage. But Again, this is more evidence to me that households are strapped. They don't have cash. They've piled up a bunch of debt, and they are using their house again as an ATM machine, except now they're not refinancing into a lower rate. They're refinancing into a higher rate, right? And all of those higher uh, payments are going to be a drag going forward on the economy when people now have higher uh, mortgage rates because they refinanced into a higher rate. Of course, you know, people still think they have home equity, but wait till the real estate prices really start to come down, which again, I still think is going to be the case. I think that we're going to see more upward pressure on, uh, on mortgage rates. And at some point, of course, that whole refi well is going to run dry, that the rates are going to be so much higher that it's not going to make any sense to refinance. And of course, you can't refinance if you don't have uh, the equity. So if, if the real estate prices drop, if the market goes down, then even if you want to refinance, you can't do it because you, you don't have enough equity in the house to qualify for the new mortgage. And of course, a lot of people too don't realize, or maybe they do, but when you refinance your mortgage, if it's a big mortgage, like a jumbo mortgage, then not as much of that uh, mortgage is tax deductible because they lowered the limits on how much you can deduct on a mortgage. And if you refinance a mortgage, you may be refinancing a mortgage that used to be fully tax deductible, the interest on the mortgage. And now some of that interest may no longer be tax deductible because the when you refinance, that's not grandfathered in. That's a brand new mortgage. And so that takes uh, the, the current rules. The only way that you can be grandfathered in is if you don't refinance and you continue to make payments on a mortgage that you took out when the rules were, were different. But getting back to gold, I think gold really is the untold story here. I mean, I'm watching a lot of the financial channels and they're not really covering it much. I mean, it was up 18%, right? I guess compared to the 30% right gain in the stock market, nobody really cares about an 18% gain in the price of gold. 
except that's a decent move uh, for the price of gold, and it really tells you something. I mean, obviously, it means the dollar relative to gold has lost 18% of its purchasing power, and that's in a year where the dollar hasn't really lost any of its purchasing power relative to other fiat currencies. So gold is you know, rising against every fiat currency in the world. But I think the strong finish that we're getting uh, to the year and the decade is indicative or telling us that we're likely to have a lot of strength to continue in the new year and into the new decade, not only in the gold bullion, but even more so in the gold stocks, the whole commodity complex. Look at what's going on uh, with oil prices. You know, we're almost at $62 a barrel now in crude oil. And, you know, I think that we're setting up for a very, very bullish move. Not a lot of people are optimistic. You know, oil stocks were among the worst performing stocks, not only of the year, but of the decade. And uh, there's not a lot of optimism out there in the oil patch about oil prices. And I think that that they're wrong. I think there's too much pessimism uh, when it comes to uh, oil. And I think the the contribution from fracking and, and, and the Bakken and all that is overblown because I know a lot of the money that was invested was lost. I mean, the returns just were not there for all the money that was plowed into the oil and gas market that produced a lot of this oil. I mean, we certainly produced a lot of oil. But we didn't produce it in a cost-effective manner. The problem is the wells that were drilled were a lot more expensive than people thought. And the production uh, declined much more rapidly than people believed. So the investors really weren't getting their money out of these wells. And so the next time the oil price goes up, I don't think you're going to see a rush of new drilling. Everybody just assumes, oh, you know, if the oil price moves up, we're going to have this big increase in supply from all this extra drilling. I don't think the investors are willing to get burned again. They already lost a lot of money when oil was $100 a barrel, right? People put a lot of money into the ground at $100 oil and lost a good portion of it because the costs were too high and the production was too low. And so I don't think you're going to have this big new supply. And if oil prices go up to $78 a barrel, it's not like we're going to have this rush of drilling that's going to push the price back down. I think prices are going up. And I think the bigger move, though, is going to be in the grain market. I think agriculture, especially if the Chinese end up you know, doing what the Trump claims are going to do, if the Chinese really buy $40, $50 billion worth of U.S. farm products every year, if they really basically double or triple uh, what they're buying, that is going to put a lot of upward pressure on prices. Right? Prices are going up. This is going to be the decade of the commodity market, just like the 1970s were stagflation. Commodities did very well in that market. The U.S. dollar got clobbered during the 1970s. Gold, silver did extremely well as stocks went down. That is where we're headed right now. You have all this uh, unfounded optimism. Nobody is worried, even though there's all sorts of massive problems Problems that are far bigger than anything that people were ignoring back in 2005, 2006, 2007, right? There are a lot of problems. When, when the two decades ago, right, when we ended out the 20th century, right, 1999, New Year's from uh, January 1st, 2000, right, that was, we were right at the peak of a, uh, of a stock market bubble, right? The only thing people that were, were worried about at the end of the 1990s was the computers, Y2K. People were worried that somehow the computers weren't going to work. And then when January 1st came along and everything was fine, well, then there clearly was nothing to worry about because all they were worrying about was Y2K. There were a lot more problems to be worried about. Uh, and then, you know, we had the big drop in the stock market. We had the crash uh, in 2001. But the Fed, unfortunately, led by Alan Greenspan, spared the economy of the consequences that it should have suffered. And we, and had we suffered them, we'd be in much better shape by now. But we didn't, right? We kicked the can down the road. We made a deal with the devil. And I think in 2020s, in this decade, the devil's going to collect. Now, I know a lot of people are thinking, oh, well, what if we make it through the 1920s, right? What if we just keep on running these big deficits? Because, look, Peter, you've been wrong before, right? You you know, uh, you said these bad things were going to happen. And, look, we went through the entire decade and nothing bad really happened. Well, you know, sure, we didn't have a final collapse, but a lot of bad things happened beneath the surface. But meanwhile, even if we just get a repeat of the decade that we had before this one. 
you know, from 2000 to 2010, foreign stocks did a lot better than U.S. stocks. Gold did a lot better than U.S. stocks. Emerging markets did a lot better than U.S. stocks. Commodities did a lot better than U.S. stocks. If we just go back to that decade, right, my investment strategy is going to clobber be along the S&P. But I don't think we're just going to go back to that decade. As I said earlier, we're going to go back to something far worse than that. We're going to go to an economic environment uh, that is going to be more reminiscent of a combination of the 1970s and 1930s. Even if we don't get that, if we just go back to the 2000s, to 2010, right? You can still make a lot of money in my investment strategy, even if I'm wrong about how bad things are going to get in the 2020s. And of course, if they don't get that bad in the 2020s, well, they'll get even worse in the 2030s, right? In the 30s. But I don't think we're going to get there because we're either going to elect a socialist in 2020, like Bernie Sanders, or we're going to elect one in 2024, right? We're going socialist either way. Right? And even if Trump manages to get reelected because everything hasn't completely imploded uh, by election day of 2020, right, it's going to implode you know, shortly thereafter. And so either way, it's going to get blamed on Trump and capitalism, the Republicans. So this decade of the, the 2020s is going to be a decade of socialism, whether it starts in the first year of the decade or the fourth year of the decade, the decade is going to be dominated by socialism. It's going to be dominated by modern monetary theory, right? Out with the Tea Party, as I said earlier, and in with MMT, modern monetary theory. Again, there's nothing modern about it. It's not a theory, and it's not really monetary. It's just printing press money. It's just, you know, helicopter money. I mean, this has been tried over and over again and has always failed. And that's not going to stop us from trying it here. And, of course, it's not going to stop it from failing here because it can't succeed. But that's where we are. This decade promises to be a complete disaster. And I think that even people who listened to me early, a decade ago, they're still going to be better off than people who never listened to me because they're not going to be prepared. They are going to be completely blindsided by the way this decade is going to uh, play out. Another group, though, that's going to be very blindsided and surprised by what happens during this decade are all the crypto people, the Bitcoin bugs, who are so confident that Bitcoin is going to reign supreme. Right? If you look at all the articles and all the coverage from the Bitcoin bugs, they want to talk about the fact that Bitcoin was the number one performing investment of the decade, which I guess it was, right? Because it started the decade below a dollar, and here it is, you know, above 7000 a coin, and it was below a dollar, so nothing can compete with that. So, yes, Bitcoin was the best investment of the decade, right? And ask anybody who owns Bitcoin, they will tell you that. They'll also tell you that it was the best investment of the year. Because Bitcoin is up about 100%. It's about doubled, right? It's about 7,000. As I'm recording this, it's a little above 7,200. And that's, you know, about double. It was, what, 3,200, 3,300, something like that when it started the year. So the price of Bitcoin is doubled, right? So that beats out just about any other asset class. So again, uh, the Bitcoiners are claiming, hey, Bitcoin is the greatest. You know, we've done the best. But again, they're being very selective in their time frames and in overlooking what has happened recently. The main reason, in fact, the only reason that Bitcoin was such a good performing investment in 2019 was because it was such a bad performing investment in 2018. 2018, I think Bitcoin was down about 70%. So because it was down 70%, it was able to double in 2019, but still be way down from its peak. Remember, Bitcoin peaked out at about 20,000. And so it went down to 3,000, and now it's at 7,000. But over the last two years... Bitcoin is still down. That's what all the Bitcoin bugs are overlooking. They're overlooking the more recent performance when they're looking at, oh, how did we do over the last decade? Or if they just want to look at this year without putting it into the context of two years because you had such a big decline in the year that preceded it. Also, uh, the Bitcoin guys don't want to look at the second half of 2019, because during the second half of 2019, Bitcoin is down about 50%. Remember, Bitcoin was up at almost 14,000 uh, midway through the year, right? That's about where it peaked, just below 14,000. Now again, 7,250 or something like that. So Bitcoin has been extremely weak during the second half of this year. In fact, during the month of December, 
Bitcoin hasn't rallied at all. It's pretty much exactly where it was at the beginning of the month. There's been no Santa Claus rally, no year-end rally, while every other asset class in the world, whether it's stocks, gold, silver, oil, everything's been going up, right, except Bitcoin. Now, I guess, you know, for all those people who like to say, oh, look, Bitcoin's real value is that it's non-correlated. Yeah, it's non-correlated. It's the only asset not going up. Okay, it's non-correlated. So what's that worth? Big deal. Uh, But the Bitcoiners have to ask themselves, why is it Bitcoin going up? If all this good stuff is happening, right, you got the halvening they keep talking about, right, and all this stuff and this huge uh, infrastructure is being built out and all this great stuff is happening, why is the price not going up, right? If we're having all this good news and the market isn't rallying on all this good news, then what's going to make it rally? And why isn't it rallying? And if it's not rallying on good news, well, then what does that mean? That means the market is going down. That is the reality. You know, again, if you look at the search engines and look at Bitcoin as a search term, you'll see that Bitcoin today is no more popular online than it was two and a half years ago. You know, it hasn't gained any popularity. It peaked out in popularity at the end of 2017 when it had that huge run. And, you know, it's way down. Bitcoin depends on a new supply of buyers coming into the market. Well, in order for you to come into the market, you got to at least do a little research, right? You would expect that people who don't own any Bitcoin Right, who were thinking about buying Bitcoin for the first time, you would think they would search the internet and you know research Bitcoin, how to buy Bitcoin, you know what's the price of Bitcoin. That you'd have more and more people searching for Bitcoin. That's not happening. More people aren't searching today than we're searching two and a half years ago. So if you're not having a huge influx of new buyers, how are the existing holders going to get out? They can only get out by selling to the other existing holders who want to, you know, increase their position. But that means you're running out of uh, uh, suckers, right? You're running out of chain in the chain letter or, you know, the Ponzi scheme is coming to an end, right? That That's what's going on. Uh, so I think what's going to happen in this decade is uh, the Bitcoin bugs are going to be surprised because Bitcoin may have been the best performing investment of the last decade, but it's probably going to be the worst performing investment of this decade. Now, of course, maybe not. Maybe there'll be some other cryptocurrency that does worse than Bitcoin. In fact, there probably will be because there's like 5,000 of these things now. Hey, maybe Bitcoin will be the best performing cryptocurrency, but it could still be down 99% or who knows what it's going to do uh, because all these other currencies can go down even more. But the Bitcoin community is you know, going to be in for a rude awakening at some point during this decade. It's unfortunate because a lot of the other things that has caused people to buy Bitcoin are going to happen. They're going to see the big collapse of the dollar. They can see the dollar lose its reserve currency status. They can see uh, massive inflation, uh, maybe hyperinflation. Who knows? A lot of this stuff is going to happen. But what's not going to happen is that people are going to take refuge in, in Bitcoin as a safe haven. They are going to go into gold. Right. Gold is where the central banks are moving. Gold is where the real money is moving. And remember, the gains that Bitcoin had during this decade, we had no crisis during this decade. Everybody was buying everything. Right. Nobody knows how Bitcoin is going to behave in an actual crisis. Nobody knows. And in fact, if you you think about it, if you really are worried, right, let's say you're you've got a lot of wealth. And all of a sudden you're worried. You're worried about inflation. You're worried about the stock market. And you just, you want something safe. Are you really going to take a chance on Bitcoin? I mean, A, something that you don't even understand. Something that's only been around for 10 years. And something that was at 20,000. And now it's at 7,000. And it could go down to 700. I mean, you have no idea. I mean, there's no way that you're going to seek out refuge in something as speculative uh, and intangible as Bitcoin. Whereas if you got something that's been around for thousands of years, something that you know that you could trust, that's honest and real, right, that doesn't have this crazy volatility, it seems to me that in a time of crisis, when the real money is actually worried and looking for a safe haven, gold's going to win hands down. There's no way Bitcoin is going to beat out gold in a battle for the safe havens. In fact, even if you look at it now, Right. People say, oh, you know, what if you you know, bought gold at the high? All right. If you bought gold at the high this year, you're down about three percent. If you bought it at the exact high. Right. 
you know, now, of course, if you bought it most other points during the year, you're ahead because the goal is at 1,515. It's up 18% on the year. So most people who bought gold this year, they're making money. They're, now, if you bought the absolute high, okay, you're down 3%. That's not that bad. Most people who bought Bitcoin for the first time this year are losing money. In fact, there are people who bought Bitcoin this year. If you bought the exact high, you're down about 50%. That's not a store of value. How could, you're down 50% in a few months. How could you call that a store of value? How can you call that a safe haven investment? You know, So there is no comparison. The volatility is massive when it comes to Bitcoin versus gold. The potential for loss is enormous. In fact, Bitcoin has probably a greater potential to lose than just about any other asset. So nobody is going to be nervous. Hey, let me sell my dollars. Let me sell my euros because I'm worried. And I'm going to put my money into Bitcoin. I mean, Bitcoin could collapse so much more. I mean, if you're worried about your dollars, you, you have even more to worry about if you buy Bitcoin. The same thing if you're in the stock market. Or if you own land, oh, I'm going to sell my real estate. I'm worried about the economy. I'm going to sell my real estate and let me buy Bitcoin. Who's going to do that? Nobody's going to do that. Right? I mean, other than the Bitcoin bugs, but a guy that doesn't own any Bitcoin now, who thinks the economy is great, doesn't have a care in the world, all of a sudden he gets worried because inflation is picking up, the economy is tanking, and he decides to sell some real estate. He decides to sell some of his um, a stock portfolio. And now what is he going to do? He's going to gamble on Bitcoin? No, he's not. He's going to buy gold if he's smart, right? If he's not as smart, he'll probably just put it in the bank, you know, buy, you know, government bonds or something like that. But the people who are really smart, they're going to see the risk in government bonds. But they're not going to be worried about government bonds and so, oh, let me just buy Bitcoin because then they'll have to worry even more. You know, another bad thing that's going to happen too in the new year is 24 states are going to be raising the minimum wage. And I know the way you know you, you hear this covered or read about this, this is supposedly a good thing, right? Oh, this is great news, right? 24 states are raising the minimum wage. You know, in a lot of these states, they passed these minimum wage increases years ago. And they're just like automatically every year they go up. And you know, a lot of them are trying to get to $15 an hour. And there's a lot of states that have some pretty big percentage jumps uh, January 1st, 2020, because a lot of these... Uh, laws were passed in 2016, right, 2017, and so they, you know, they basically back end loaded them. So a lot of the impact of the higher minimum wage would be felt in the future, right? Because they didn't want to deal with it right away. So they figured, okay, we'll back end it. We'll make sure that you know we don't have the full impact of the higher wages until later on when you know you know maybe we can blame it on something else or maybe we'll, we won't be in office anymore, whatever. But these chickens are coming home uh, to roost. And, you know, so you're going to see a increase again in wages, the cost of hiring people, which is going to put more uh, pressure on employers to fire people rather than pay them the higher wage. Uh, but I guess over the last couple of years, with all the cheap money and all this bubble economy, uh, you know, the the uh, increase in the minimum wage hasn't necessarily done as much damage uh, to the job market as it ultimately is going to do because, A, it's a cumulative effect, right? We keep on increasing the wages. So maybe the last hike wasn't enough to generate a pink slip, but maybe the next one will. But as the economy turns, as we move into recession, uh, the, the weight of these wage hikes, minimum wage increases, it is going to be much, much heavier. And I think we're going to see a very big impact on payrolls. It's not necessarily going to be blamed on the minimum wage because, uh, a lot of the, the layoffs may happen years after the minimum wage laws uh, went into effect that initially you know, triggered the, the hikes. But it's going to happen. And we're getting rising wages. We're getting rising prices you know, in other parts of the economy, commodity prices, oil prices. I think we're going to get agriculture prices going up, interest rates going up. So all this, this, the inflationary stage has been set. It's unfortunate that very few people can understand or appreciate what they're looking at, what they're seeing unfolding before their eyes, because they're, they're still, you know, oblivious because they're looking at the U S stock market or looking at the unemployment rate and they're thinking everything is great. But again, those are the same people who thought everything was great just before the economy went off the edge of a cliff in, in 2008, you know, on a lighter note too, I, I was just reading again that that new law in California goes into effect also on January 1st, when it comes to, uh, board members. California passed this ridiculous law that said that publicly traded companies based in California had to at least have one female member of the board of directors.
Now, of course, I, I mean, there should not be a, a gender-based test. I mean, the board of directors should be the board of directors. I mean, if I'm a shareholder of a company and I want a board, uh, I don't want the board members there because they're women or because they're minorities. I want them there because they're the most qualified for the job, right? That that should be the only criteria is who's going to best serve the interest of the shareholders, not, you know, who is going to best reflect, you know, the the the, uh, the gender makeup or the ethnic makeup of the community or something like that. But the ridiculous part about this uh, California law is the language that they, they put in it, right? Because I was reading this article about how, you know, companies are now frantically trying to get a female board member in place because the deadline is coming up. They got to have one if they they didn't have one. But because of the pressures from uh, all of the various factions of victims uh, that comprise the left these days, the requirement is not that you have a female board member, meaning a biological female, right? A woman with uh, XX chromosomes, you know, and ovaries, what the law requires is that you have at least one person on the board that self-identifies as female. Now, the reason they had to put this in there is they wanted to make sure that, you know, the, the LGBTQ community uh, was covered. That if there was, you know, a guy that was in transition or whatever uh, who, you know, who feels ex- identifies as a woman, right, that that, that that person would count as a woman. Right. So they put that in there to throw that bone to that that faction of 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 the left that needed to be represented. But the minute they did that, of course, they neutered the entire thing. Right. Because if the requirement is that you just have to have somebody who identifies as a woman on the board, well, then what stops any of the current men? who are serving on a board, all you need is one guy to stand up and take one for the team and say, hey, I identify as a woman, and there you go. I mean, really, there's nothing you can do because once you identify yourself as a woman, they they don't have a litmus test. They can't say, well, prove that you identify as a woman because you could identify as a woman any way you want. I mean, I can identify as a lesbian woman, right? Because lesbians are women. I could say I identify as a really butch lesbian. I'm one of these lesbians who likes to dress up like a man, right? But that's who I identify with. Well, what are you going to do? So I, 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 you know, I don't know what's going to happen with this law, but to me, it's ridiculous. No, I would love to see. In fact, I, if I was on a board of one of these companies, I would, I would identify as a woman. I like to see uh, anybody make a big deal out of that because I don't think you can. Because I think the community doesn't want you to be able to question somebody, right? You just can't say you're not really, a, you, you know, you're making it up. You're only pretending because then, you know, then you're you're being insensitive. Then you're being a homophobe or whatever you are. Right. So you can't do that. You just have to accept if somebody claims that they're a woman, it doesn't matter what they look like, how they dress. You just got to say, OK, you're a woman. Right. And so, you know, the law, as far as I'm concerned, the law is absolutely meaningless because it doesn't require anybody to actually do anything because the left got so far to the left that they und- they, they basically undid everything. Right. Because what they were trying to do, they, they got back to zero. In fact, I wonder if there's going to be some boiling point, some tipping point between, let's say, the women and the LBGQs, because the women want all these special rights, but all these special rights or privileges, rather, are now in jeopardy. Because if any guy can get them by claiming to identify as a woman, then, you know, whatever progress they think they've made is going to be lost. So at some point, there's going to have to be a civil war here uh, within this community. But right now, the coalition, you know, still is pretty tight. But I have a feeling that pretty soon they're, you know, it's not about just eating the rich. They're going to start eating themselves. You know, I'm talking about the left, too. I I happen to, uh, you know, catch, you know, Bernie Sanders has been going around with AOC, you know, uh, Akasha Cortez, uh, she's been coming at his rallies and she's, you know, endorsed him. And, you know, that's really helping Bernie Sanders, you know, with the Latino vote, the young people. Um, but, you know, one of the talks she was up there and she was saying how the United States is a fascist nation, right? That we're not, you know, this great nation. We're, we're fascist, right? She was using the, the F word fascism to describe America. And, you know, the irony of all this is that she's right. We are fascist, but not for the reasons that that AOC believes. We're fascists because we've embraced many of the policies that she is championing. You know, what people don't realize is that fascism is really one. I mean, fascists lost World War II, right? The two big fascist nations, Italy and Germany, lost the Second World War. But their ideology won. Unfortunately, that's what happened. Remember, the Nazi Party 
is national socialism. Socialism is the operative word there. They're, fascists are socialists. Fascism is a form of socialism, just like communism is a form of socialism. That's why the fascists and the communists are such adversaries, right? Because they're basically fighting over the same turf. It's which brand of Uh, socialism is going to win out. They're very similar to one another, right? And it's the similarities that breeds all the animosity because, you know, they're, 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 they're rival gangs fighting over the same turf. People don't get that. Now, yes, the, the fascists in Nazi Germany, there was an element of racism there because of, you know, the Aryan nation and anti-Semitism, but you didn't have that in, in, in Italy under Mussolini. And Mussolini actually came first. I mean, uh, Germany's fascism was basically modeled after Italy's fascism. But what fascism really is, is a form of socialism where instead of nationalizing uh, the means of production, the government controls the means of production through regulation and taxation for the good of the people, right? That is what has been going on. We have high levels of taxation, high levels of regulation. The world has really embraced ideology, the the ideology of fascism. All this stuff, government health care, government education, all this stuff, these are tenets of fascism to have the government do this, right? What um, the... The left is advocating, right? Bernie Sanders and AOC, they're not advocating that the U.S. government nationalize the means of production the way a communist would. They want the government to take over the means of production through the tax code, right? Equitable ownership in the means of production, not legal title to the means of production, but hey, let's let somebody pretend that they own it. Let's let some private people run it, but we'll run it for the benefit of the government because we're going to claim the lion's share of the income in taxation, and we're going to have all kinds of regulation. The government's going to micromanage and plan the economy. I mean, all of this is fascism. So when AOC says America has become fascist, she's right. She's right for the wrong reasons. And she wants to make America even more fascist than it already is. See, what I want to do is I want to get fascism out of America, right? Which means I don't want Sanders. I don't want AOC. I want to go back to the Constitution. I want to go back to limited government, to freedom. I want to get rid of the income tax, the personal income tax, the corporate income tax. I want citizens, the private sector, to not only have legal title to the means of production, but to own the means of production, right? Because they don't have to cut the, cut, you know, give the government half the profits, which is what the government is taking. When you add all the the tax levels uh, on the code, the government is making more money, especially when you throw in the payroll taxes. I mean, the U.S. government, if you take any Fortune 500 company and you look at all the taxes they pay, payroll taxes, you look at the taxes that their employees pay, withholding taxes, the U.S. government makes far more money off of any enterprise, off of any gov- on any private enterprise than the actual owners, right? So if they actually nationalize it, how much extra would they make? Maybe not even, maybe less, because people work harder when they think they're working for themselves than if they're working for the government. I mean, that's one thing that the fascists understand that the communists don't, right? That you, the government can actually be bigger if it allows uh, private ownership, but just takes the lion's share of the profits because the, you're making more money than taking all the profits and having to run the company yourself because then the government runs it into the ground. At least when it's run by the private sector, you know, it could be run you know, somewhat efficiently uh, and generate profits out of which the government could take all this tax revenue. But when the government takes over running the companies all together, they destroy all the profits. Right. That's why, you know, they keep talking about all they want to tax the rich, tax the riches, all this wealth. Well, they're going to destroy most of the wealth before they get around to taxing it. I wanted to finish up this podcast, though, on a positive note, talking about that church suit shooting in in Texas. And on a positive note, not because there was a shooting and because two people, unfortunately, were shot to death uh, while they were, you know, worshiping at a church. But the positive note is that Unlike the last time there was a church shooting, this time there are a lot of people at the church, right, other parishioners who were armed, right? They, I think they changed the laws uh, since that church shooting and people were allowed to bring firearms into this church. And fortunately, that's what happened because this guy opened fire. He brought a shotgun into the church and he started firing and he killed two people. But within six seconds, 
of the first shot being fired, he was shot dead by a, a churchgoer who was carrying a legally concealed firearm on his person. And so the minute he saw this guy with a gun, he drew his weapon and fired and killed him with one shot. That was it. That was the end of the mass shooting. That wasn't, it wasn't a mass shooting, but there were 240 people in that church. It could have been a mass murder. Who knows how many people? He killed two people in six seconds. Well, what if he had been firing for a minute, for 60 seconds? What about two minutes? Who knows how many rounds he would have been able to fire uh, had he not been taken out? And, you know, the media is not going to, you know, be covering this the way it should. Because, you know, as far as they're concerned, they would be much happier if none of the uh, people in the church were armed. If the only one that had a gun was the shooter. And he would have shot 30 or 40 people. Then it would have been great, right? Then they could have had all these people who would have died. And they could have brought out all the people saying, we need more gun control. You see, guns kill people. Look at how bad guns are. Uh, All these people were killed. But that story is not going to happen because people had guns. You see, if there was strict gun control, right? You have a lot of people that say we should have no guns, right? So let's say we had laws that said it's illegal. You can't carry your guns. No one can have a gun walking around, right? You can't, you know, if that were the case, then the guy that shot this shooter would not have had a gun. And so instead of shooting back, he would have had a hide like everybody else. He would have had to duck down or run for it. He couldn't have done anything. Because if someone has a gun and you have nothing, what are you going to do? You either hide or you run. But because this guy was armed, he had a third choice. Shoot back. And that's what he did. And he took this guy out. But if it was illegal to own a gun, then nobody in that church would have had a gun except the criminal shooter who was there to commit mass murder. Now, a lot of people think, well, if, if we had gun control and no one was allowed to have guns, well, then that guy wouldn't have had a gun either. Nobody would have had a gun. Well, that is BS. Because guns exist, it's not like if we have gun control, there's going to be no guns. Guns are going to be there, and criminals are always going to get them. See, because criminals, by definition, break the law, right? That's why they're criminals. They don't care about the law. They don't have any respect for the law. You know, if you're a criminal and you're going to commit a robbery or you're going to kill somebody, you're, you're not going to say, oh, wait a minute, I can't commit this robbery with a gun because I'd be breaking the law. You're already breaking the law. Committing a robbery is breaking the law, right? So once you're a lawbreaker, well, it doesn't, it doesn't matter how many laws you break, right? It's the law-abiding people that have respect for the law, that obey all the laws, that obey the gun control laws. The criminals that disobey the laws, that are lawless, they couldn't give a damn about how many laws say you can't have a gun because they're going to break the law. doesn't matter. In fact, the criminals love it when you have gun control laws because they know other people are going to obey the law. Their victims are going to obey the law. And so now it's easier for them to prey on people who are unarmed, right? This guy picked the wrong church uh, to have a uh, mass shooting because unfortunately for him and fortunately for everybody else, uh, the, uh, the other people had guns too. And so they were able to kill him before he was able to kill a lot more people. But of course, even look, even if he didn't have a gun, he look, he could have drove his truck into that church, you know, killed some people by running them over. I mean, you can kill people. You don't need a gun. I mean, this guy, I guess there weren't, I don't think anybody died at the, at the rabbi's house in New York, but the guy came in with a machete. I mean, I I mean, you know, you can kill people with a machete too, but obviously if somebody has a machete, right, it's better if you have a gun, Right? You, you, know, you, you have a better chance of taking the guy out before he kills anybody if you have a gun. A gun is the great equalizer. It equalizes the victim uh, with the perpetrator. And in this case, it worked out. So I'm sure the media is not going to play this uh, the way it should from the proper angle. This is an example of guns saving lives. Because law-abiding citizens were armed, they were able to protect themselves against criminals who will always be armed no matter what gun control law you want to pass. But anyway, that's it. That wraps it up. Uh, This should be the last podcast I do for this year, for this decade. I'm not planning on doing anything uh, on uh, New Year's Eve. Uh, Hopefully everybody has a great time, a safe time. Uh, Get home safe. 
Uh, and I want to wish everybody a happy new year who's been listening to my podcast. You know, the audience has been growing for the podcast. I'm looking at uh, my social media accounts, my YouTube channel. A lot of people listen to the podcast on YouTube. I'm up to 275,000 uh, subscribers to my YouTube channel. I've got a number of people now following me on Twitter. What is it? A hundred over 177,000 Twitter followers. I forget how many people on Facebook. But if you're not already a Facebook fan or a Twitter follower or a subscriber to uh, my uh, my YouTube channel, go and do that. Invite your friends to do that. My goal, though, in 2020 is to really up the quality of the podcast, to do more of the videos, live feeds. I'm intending to build. A, uh, a sound studio on my property in Puerto Rico. In part, you know, a motivating was my wife who uh, sings in a band in our town in Dorado, and she wanted a place for the band to practice and to record some music. Uh, and she was, she was kind of pushing me about building a sound studio on the property. But also, since I can maybe kill two birds with one stone, I can do that for my wife. But also, I can have an upgraded studio uh, for uh, my own uh, podcasting and video production, and I can move my equipment from my office in Puerto Rico when I do videos, when I do uh, interviews. Who knows? Maybe in the next decade, maybe I'll be back on the mainstream financial media. Maybe as more as my predictions really start to pan out in a very measurable way, you know, as gold is taken off, as, you know, the dollar is getting killed, as the economy is a mess, and all these really bad things start to happen in a way that actually sinks in with certain uh, people in, in, in the media and other members of the press. Uh, maybe they'll start seeking me out. So I think it'll be good if I have a really up my game when it comes to my ability uh, to produce uh, audio and video content. But even if it's just me doing it myself, uh, I can deliver a better product to the people who are listening to me um, in the new year. And don't forget, you know, if you haven't already uh, purchased a copy of the Bubble Movie, uh, definitely go out and get that. Get that before the Bubble Movie 2 comes out. You know, you want to go to Let Us uh, Disagree.com and, and, and pick that up. Make that a New Year's resolution to watch the Bubble Movie uh, between, uh, you know, you know, early in the new year, probably not enough time. If you haven't watched it already, probably not going to watch it this year. But get that watched because there's a lot of good information in there. we got to help uh, disseminate that information to the public. And I think if I, you know, up the quality of what I'm doing, uh, the technical capabilities of what I'm doing uh, at Shift Radio and the Peter Schiff podcast, uh, who knows? I might even get another book written. I'm sure I will write another one. It's been a while since my last one. I know I also want to update how an economy grows and why it crashes. So I'm sure I'll I'll be doing some more uh, writing in in the next decade. But again, again, I want to thank everybody, uh, all the listeners uh, who have uh, you know followed me over the years and have you know really helped me to build up uh, the the quality and the reach of this podcast. Because when the, when the year began, I mean, I was still doing the Peter Schiff show. I started doing the radio show. The podcast evolved over time as I kind of lost uh, the, you know, I, I didn't really have the, the time to do to do the daily radio show. In fact, I wasn't doing the daily radio show when the decade began. I was, you know, I ran for Senate in 2010, and it was when that Senate campaign ended. I was trying to find a way to kind of stay relevant politically and to get my voice out there. And then I started uh, the talk show after that. But I, uh, you know, soon realized that I just was too demanding on my time to do that. But I may devote more time in the future in this next decade to this podcast than I have in the past, uh, as a lot of the things that I've been forecasting really start to come true. And I need to be a voice of reason, a voice of sanity out there, like a lone voice in the wilderness uh, to try to break through uh, all of the anti-capitalism that's going to be out there, the socialism, all this bad stuff that's going to happen in this decade, in the, in the 2020s. It's all going to be blamed on fairly on capitalism, and I want to make sure that there's somebody out there blaming government, blaming central banks, uh, so that we have a chance of, of having real solutions that will work, that we may, in fact, one day actually be able to make America great again, instead of just pretending that we made America great again by doing more of what made it ungreat in the first place. Mm -hmm.